What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Now if you like content like this and you want to be able to get more of it, do me a favor, make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit that little alert bell so you know whenever videos like this come out. Now today I want to do another one of these career coaching classes. And what this is, is that these are the things that normally I work with some of the biggest brands in the world on to help them be more creative, be more innovative, help leaders get better, and just sort of help everybody be more creative. This one in particular is going to be around working remote. Now, I work for Envision, and for honestly, since we've been founded, we've been a 100% remote company. I've been working remote for the last two years, and now leading remote is different. But I think there's a lot more skills than you think that probably translate. So what I want to do today is I want to walk through a couple different things. I want to walk through what are going to be some of the challenges? What are some of the benefits? How do you actually need to work deliberately? How do you need to focus on your culture? And most of all, how do you need to focus on trust? So that's what I want to walk through today is that this is a really a deck and a session I've done for a lot of different companies. So I know that it helps and hopefully it'll help you too. Okay, well, let's talk about leading remote teams. Now, before we get started, there is a free resource I want to be able to point out because I, I think that, you know, look, this is going to be, I don't know what, the 40-minute version of this, but there are going to be some things we're going to skim over. There are some things that we could go into more detail on that we just won't. But the book is, what I'd have you do is go over to designbetter.co. Now, what we did was sort of all the different thought leaders, all the different people at Envision got together, and we tried to put together this book, which is Remote Work for Design Teams. Now, even if you're not on a design team, don't let that run you off because this is really just what is the best advice, the best thinking, the best things that we could do about working remote. It's it's totally free. You just I think you have to put in your name and your email address. You can download it as an EPUB, PDF, whatever you want. So take a minute and go check that out. Now, there's a couple things we want to talk about today. The first one is going to be just what are some of the challenges, obvious and otherwise, they're going to come with doing remote leadership. They may be a little bit different than what you think, so we want to talk about that. I do want to talk about some of the glass half full things. What are the benefits of actually being able to do remote leadership? We want to be able to talk about how do you work? What are the ways that you should think about this? And what are some of the things you should do? We want to be able to talk about your culture and, and how should you think about how do you bring people together? How do we create culture in a time that can feel so disconnected? And lastly, I want to talk about trust. I, I've talked about this in, in, in some other videos, but I want to revisit it here because here again, I feel like it's a really big part of, of what we're going to talk about. But let's start with some of the challenges for doing remote leadership. And the, the thing here is that, you know, one, leading a, re, a fully remote team is different than leading a distributed or a partially remote team. You may feel like, oh, I've done this in the past. I fell into that trap and thinking, oh, I'm really good at this. And there are just some things I didn't really appreciate that were going on here. But that's the question here is that really how do we help people navigate some of these obvious and, and even some of the hidden challenges in remote work whenever as a leader – People are going to be looking to us for answers. The first one, and I think this is the biggest one, is that whenever we go from sort of all being together, being in a physical environment, and then all of a sudden we're all distributed and remote like this, it is really going to expose what I will describe as your sort of company's sins. If you have bad infrastructure, bad leadership, lack of trust, bad process, lack of clarity, any of these sort of things are going to become really exposed and really run to the surface. So any of this like organizational sin is suddenly going to become an issue because all of a sudden now we're being asked to work differently. And in many cases, the things that we could probably cover up whenever we're all together are going to get exposed much more just because of the way that we're working now. But also, and especially in the leadership space, and, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but in a lot of cases, these the leadership models and the mentalities that we've had, and I would argue that a lot of them that haven't really been working, are now going to not work or fail much faster because this is going to prioritize trust and personal connections and, and these sort of things that we're going to talk about today. And if these have not been the things that you've invested in, if these are the things you don't feel like you're going to be good at, you're going to struggle here because it really isn't about, and, and I would argue that in many cases, remote it really lets you become much more personal, lets you see into people's lives much more than what you get into the office. And so it's going to be a challenge, where I, and I'm already seeing it, of a lot of leaders who are struggling to continue to do this. But one of the biggest things for you and for everybody on your team is going to be just how you think about work, how you think about your day is going to be completely different because it used to be you'd have a block of time in the morning at your house 
what that would be for yourself. And then you would leave and you'd go to this other space. You'd go to an office and that would be sort of your time for work. And then you would leave there and come back home for a personal time again. And of course, there's going to be some bleed on either side of that. But generally, there were sort of these three blocks to our day. All of that's going to get put into a blender. Because whenever you're working at home, kids are at home, pets are around, all of these things that are going on, you're going to have to flip in and out of work and personal time. And I think not only is it important for you to understand that as a leader that you're going to need that, but it's going to be, make, it's going to be important for you to make that okay for everybody else so that they understand that this is what it's going to be. Even from, I've been working remote for two years. If I go to the grocery store in the middle of the day, I still feel like I'm getting away with something. There's a lot of institutional thinking and baggage that we're going to bring into this, and we're going to need to think about what this stuff is. But one of the biggest things that I've been getting asked, or one of the biggest things that people have been reaching out about, have really been, you know, they have this mentality of you have to see people working to know that they're doing it. And oftentimes, whenever I have this conversation, I want to turn it back on that leader and say, well, look, what what sort of culture have you been creating? What sort of people have you been hiring? What are the things you've been doing? Where, first off, that's your one biggest concern, but where you feel like that's going to be the case. I think it can be an uncomfortable moment where just we as leaders and what we've been doing sort of gets questioned and challenged. And But this sort of thing of I need to see you to know that you're working is going to bring the productivity of your team to a grinding halt. Micromanagement, you know, this explosion of meetings, all these things, are it's going to burn people out. It's going to grind everything to a halt. This is not going to work. Other things is, and I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges, especially people to, who are new to remote work, is that it is incredibly easy to suffer in silence. Meaning that I used to be able to watch you walk into the office. I would be able to watch your body language, see how you interacted with people. What did you do for lunch, right? Like these sort of simple physical cues to be able to get a, a test and some sort of a barometer on your mental health. Well, the reality is that now I, I don't have those. And it's really easy to turn on your camera and to do these sort of things and to put on a performance for 30 or 60 minutes and make everybody believe that you're fine when you're not. And so we'll talk about how to do this in a minute, but it, it really is just the recognition that people can act and they can suffer in silence. And that, that's a very real thing. And it's going to be up to you to look at it and how to figure out how do you make sure that isn't the case. But if, as a leader, I think the other thing that you'll see is that it can also be really easy to burn out. A lot of people will think, oh, I'm at, I'm at home, I'm doing this. This has to be easier. And I've seen person after person, leader after leader, who comes into Envision, and within the first month, they are totally burnt out. Because they're doing back-to-back -back meetings on Zoom all day. They're just going as hard as they can. There are challenges that are going to be here about you know doing things like putting boundaries on your day. When do you start and when do you stop? Because it's so easy to work constantly. To be able to understand that even the little bit of time that you used to take walking between meeting rooms, going to lunch, stopping to talk to somebody in a hall, those little breaks added up. Because if you do three or four hours straight sitting here on Zoom or one of these different, you know, kind of technologies, it really adds up and it takes a toll. And so, you know, you, you're going to need to think about how do you protect yourself and not burn out. But I don't just want to concentrate on the negative. I want to look at the benefits too, because I think there's a lot that goes on here that is really beneficial, because there's a lot of upside to working remote as well. The first one is, again, everyone has talked about work-life balance for forever, and nobody seems to ever have it. But as we talked about, sort of, you know, your, your personal and professional time gets put into a blender, it does give you the ability to find some actual work-life balance, to, to, to come back to think about you. And my hope is, is that whenever a lot of this is over, whenever somebody is watching this video in the future and we look back on this pandemic as nothing but a memory, that the lasting legacy has been that we took the time to actually realize and appreciate things like mental health and taking care of yourself and understanding that creativity is an instrument just like anything else. But it will let you be able to find that balance much more if you actually protect it and, and think about things that way. But to me, the other big part of it is that you can actually focus as a leader, that is one of the toughest things is to have a one-on-one -on -one where somebody doesn't interrupt you to try to find a half an hour where you can actually think about something because so often your time and your calendar is not your own. And as a result of that, it can be really challenging. But again, the ability to shut things out, to focus, to do those sort of things is actually possible. I, again, I would encourage you to find a place to work. I don't care if it's the dining room table. I don't care what it is, but like don't sit on the couch in front of the TV. Don't do those things where you're going to distract yourself. That's not the way you would have worked whenever you were at work. So again, don't do that here. 
But it also, I think, really helps us prioritize trust. And I would argue that so many of these things, and, and even when people talk about Envision, it, it drives me a little bonkers because I don't think that, you know, I don't like it when people think that we're a novelty because we're 100% remote. I, I think we're a company that's just as successful and just as good as anybody else. It's just remote has helped us to focus on some of the other things that I think have always been important. It's just, again, whenever we were in person, we got a little lazy with them. We started to overlook them. We started to, to do these things a little bit differently. And I think trust has been a big part of this. I talked about this for years before we got into this setting where so many people are doing remote work. And now I think it's really come to the forefront because that's the thing is that I need I need to trust my people. I have no choice. I can't look and see oversee you every minute. And it asks you to be able to do that. And, and I think for the teams that have that, they have slipped into this time and been incredibly successful. For the ones that don't, it has become difficult and painful. And I think I've seen a number of people who are probably not going to continue on with their team much longer because all of a sudden they realize that there wasn't a whole lot of trust there. But in many cases, I think it also is not confusing remote. It, it is not isolated. It is not disconnected. And in many cases, I think it actually lets you have a deeper personal connection with the people you work with. Because through this technology, you get to peer into their lives. Dogs walk in the room. Kids walk in the room. Husband are walking around in the background. You, you get to see the interior of your home. There's a look into people that you never got whenever you were at work. It's so easy whenever you're there just to be able to sort of put on a mask and, and become this other person but you really be able to get a look into, into what's really going on with them. But the other part of it is, in, in leadership and with everything else, more of these skills that you have are going to translate than you think. Don't overcorrect and think, oh, I need to relearn and redo everything. The way that I would tell everybody to think about this is that what you want to do is to realize these were issues that were probably there before. And like I said, they were either hidden, they were overlooked. The ability to lean into these things, to work on them, to start to invest in them, those are the things that whenever we go back to whatever normal is going to look like, whenever your team gets all back together in person, it's going to allow that team to be better and to be stronger and, and to be able to be able to have more of these sort of things be able to work on that we probably, again, should have been doing in the past, but we just never had the, the real need to be able to do it. And so we would just sort of brush it under the carpet. But more than anything, right, the, the hardest thing as a leader to be able to invoke change in an organization is that there is never a good time to do it unless there is a crisis, unless there is something to be able to do that. And, and here is a moment, a once in a generation moment, when we all can pause, when we all can slow down, when we all have a reason to rethink and to evolve. And so to me, I think that's the biggest silver lining in everything that's going on. And, and even in remote work is that it gives you the ability, the reason to be able to question these things, to try new things, to evolve. And I think personally, professionally, as a leader for your team or for your company, we've never had a moment like this. And I don't know when we're going to have one again. So what better time than now as a leader to take advantage of it? But a lot of it for me is also about thinking about how do you work deliberately? And what I mean by that is that the best teams that I've been around, the best teams that I've led have worked deliberately, and they're very thoughtful in what they do. Creativity is not something that's left up to happenstance, and that's been true whether they're in person or remote. So again, I think getting into these practices, building these muscles, are going to serve you well now, and it's going to serve you well in the future. But some part of it is also realizing that tools and processes are just the foundation of what you do. They are not going to be the solution. Which video conferencing platform you use, which messaging platform you use, is not going to ultimately decide your success or not. And for me, I can see this because I can see two teams. They have identical tools. They have identical processes. They hire people from, from the same schools. But one is wildly successful and the other is essentially a low-grade dumpster fire. The reason why that is is because it's about more than just their tools or their processes. It's about more than just who they hire. It's about their culture. It's about their leadership. It's about a lot of the other things that we want to talk about. And don't get me wrong. Tools and process are incredibly important. They give you repeatable success. They give you a way for everyone to be aligned in the way that they do it. But they unto themselves are not going to be the solution. But in many cases, especially whenever you work remote, you need to become a pink elephant hunter, right? Like the, your assumptions are the enemy. That if you assume someone is doing something, they assume you're doing something. You assume that we're working in a particular way. You assume that we're communicating in a particular way. Again, you're not being explicit about what is going on. You're not being deliberate. And whenever you're doing those things, that is going to get you into a huge amount of trouble because more than likely, everybody's going to have a different assumption about what's going on, and that is not going to lead to good outcomes. 
the next part of it is that as as a as part of that is to be able to set then clear expectations. What do we want to do? How do we want to work? And this can be a number of different things. You can set clear standards around like how do you want to communicate? For instance, simple things like, hey, if I email you, get back to me today. If I send you a Slack or do something like that, like just get back to me whenever you get back to your desk. And if I text you, that is the red phone, the bat signal, I need you to get back to me now. And so again, this now removes that assumption of what is the priority of how you want me to communicate. It sets a clear standard here. And again, I think that this becomes incredibly important because now people know how to respond. It fights things like this idea that everyone should be always on. Somehow whenever we get into this digital setting, we feel like people should respond to us instantly. That didn't happen when we were in the office. It's not going to happen now. And so it be able it lets us clear those sort of things up. But also as a leader, I want you to think about what are the ripples you put out into your organization. I try to be very deliberate in this. I don't have kids. I don't sleep. If you email me at 10, 11 o'clock midnight, I will probably write you right back because I'm up and I'm working. But in many cases, what I'm going to do, especially if it's work emails or slacks or things like that, I'm actually going to hold sending that until the next morning. Because I don't want people to feel the pressure that they need to be doing that too. I don't want them to feel like they need to get back to me right away. Because again, I, I want to model and put out that behavior that I want everybody else to adopt. Even other things like meetings. And meetings can start to run rampant whenever you get into a remote setting. Because you know meetings really happen you know, or, or need to happen for a number of different reasons. And a big one is that that FOMO, fear of missing out, is probably going to go crazy. So set meetings about when are we going to communicate? How are we going to communicate? Whether it's weekly, whether it's a 15 minute stand up in the morning, whether it's, you know, again, a place and a website that we put together that has all the information about something. Understand the communication is going to be important, but don't sort of over index on flooding everybody with a million meetings just to be able to communicate little things. Again, be deliberate about what actually doesn't need a meeting. What are the times when we can do asynchronous work, whenever we can all work on a Google Doc or work on a Google Slide? or Again, where we can do these sort of things where we, we can still work and still be productive, but we don't necessarily have to be face-to-face -face with that. And look, and sometimes you can even do asynchronous work in the same online tool and open up a video chat. So you can do that. But again, be deliberate about that. And then finally, think about what actually does need a meeting. Great hack that I've seen from one of the companies that we work with is that they actually send out a Google Doc ahead of time and say, hey, I think we need a meeting because this is what we need to be able to solve for. Hey, what do you think? Do you agree? And if everybody agrees and they think that this actually needs to be a meeting, then the meeting happens. There's a very clear agenda for you to be able to do these sort of things. But think about this stuff. But a lot of it also is to keep what worked. This is what I said about not overcorrecting whenever you think about going into remote. Keep what worked. But in many cases, just rethink the tools that you're going to need to have. One of the ones that we have in Envision that is, and again, I work here because I use these tools ahead of this, is Freehand. Freehand to me is game changing. This is instead of having a whiteboard that everyone would stand around, you put post-it notes on, at the end of it, you'd like take a photo and it would say, do not erase at the top of it. You can put up, and we've had up to hundreds of people who come in and actually work in Freehand. And that this is what it allows you to do is that it creates a level playing field. Everyone can come in, they can all work, they can all do these sort of things, you can do ideations, you can do, and then you have this artifact that everybody can use. You can use it for doing design reviews, you can use it for, and that's the thing is it's so great because there's so much of this that you can do as well. But for us, we also have integrations into other tools. So like I said, you can import designs, you can do all this sort of stuff, you can present off of it. All these things that you're seeing are going to work incredibly well. The other one is boards, and this is the ability to just say, as we talk about communication and information, you can use these for designs. So if you want images, fonts, colors, you can do that. If you want to make it a mood board, if you want to be able to go in and house these different things, but it gives you a single source of truth and a place where people know to refer back to, to be able to look at this sort of stuff. You can change the layout. Again, we've seen tons of different ways that people use this, but these sort of simple tools, these community-based, these cloud-based tools are going to be the thing that are going to help you with a lot of these sort of things to be able to create central points that really help everybody. And other little tricks that I'll tell you is like if you use Zoom, use the gallery view. So in the top right hand corner, there's a little button up there that says gallery view, which sort of gives you like the Brady Bunch view where it puts everybody into little boxes. 
makes it much ever easier to see everybody. If you want to do research, if you want to be able to hold workshops, like there are actually breakout rooms in there. So you can go in and to be able to, you know, talk about something big and then send everybody off to work. Another thing that I love doing has been, and again, we, we see this all the time with sports teams and with military, with all these other things of really high functioning teams. Whenever you're on Zoom and you're doing stuff on video chat, you now have the ability to record presentations, to be able to record this different stuff and then go back and break down the film with the team afterwards. So again, how did the presentation go? What did we do really well? What could we have done better? Whenever they ask that question, how could we have handled it differently? These sort of things, again, can be really powerful and fun things to do. But that's the thing is a lot of it for me is about how do we keep everybody on the same playing field, to keep everyone connected, to not make them feel like they're missing out. It is about sort of leveling that playing field. There are even some teams that I know that go as far as if one person is only on audio, everybody goes on audio because they don't want them to feel alienated. They don't want them to be able to feel like they're missing out on something. So again, it, it just sort of depends on your culture and where you're at about how you want to do this. But I think a lot of it for you as a leader as well is to make sure that you're taking some time for you. And this is the problem is that many times our calendars are not our own. For, for quite a while, whenever I was in person, but especially whenever I was, I'm remote now, I have a meeting from 1230 to 1 every day that says eat. I have three two-hour blocks every week that say work. These are these sort of things where I want to be able to make sure that I'm creating this time, be able to create something for me where I'm sure that I have a moment to breathe, to take a break, to be able to do these sort of things so that, again, I'm sure that I'm caring for my mental health and that I can show up for everybody else. But a lot of it for me is really about just giving people the permission to be human. In many cases, this is a new experience for them. They don't know what it is they should do or how they should act. But I think that, you know, a huge part of this is about empathy. It's about humanity. It's about understanding what it is that people are going through and investing in them. Because that's the thing is it's very easy to become cold and become detached and to let th this barrier and to let the distance win. And I think for us as leaders, we have to make sure that's not the case. We have to make sure that we create spaces where that doesn't happen. And then that obviously then leads into the conversation around culture. Because, and I've said this for so long, it feels like I, everybody can just lip sync along with this, but we need to invest in cultural and emotional innovation like we invest in product innovation. Especially when it comes to creativity and a lot of these other things, this has been something that has been an, an issue that we needed to work on for some time. We just really haven't found the time to do it. But as a leader, and especially in moments like this, it is really, I think, everyone is going to look to you to help them to understand what normal is. What is acceptable. Again, get rid of those assumptions. So it's doing things like letting people know that interruptions are okay. Leave your camera on. Leave your microphone on. It's okay if your son or daughter or pet comes into the room. I mean, again, we had a meeting not long ago where one of my peers had his son walk in and basically introduce himself to the whole company in his underwear. And it's just like, look, that's what happens. And it's okay. But you don't need to apologize. You don't need to have, you know, grab, scoop up your, you know, your daughter and, you know, th th scurry her out of the room because you're on a business call. Again, this is the intersection of those sort of things. And that's what that work-life balance looks like. I think it's also letting people know that whenever you're getting adjusted to this, going slower is okay. You know, saying, look, I'm not going to be 100% today. There are these things that are going to happen that I'm not going to be 100%. And that needs to be okay. But even if people are struggling, if they're feeling really stressed out, what you want to do is you want to strike that balance because we want to acknowledge it. We want to be able to say, yes, we understand what is going on and that this is a problem. But you don't want to become paralyzed by it and confined by it. So sometimes it's also good to be able to say, look, you know, we're, for the next month, we're going to figure out what normal is together. We're going to go through this stuff and, and we're going to not, it's okay to not be okay and do that. But at a certain point, we want to be able to say, okay, look, we want to be able to figure out how do we start to put this behind us? How do we start to accept this as the normal and move on so that you don't get stuck in that spiral? And again, I think this is going to be up to you to figure out what is that time? Does things like that work? Because, you know, it is going to be up to you to sort of care for the mental state of everybody out there. But like I said before, there are other things about like, you know, it's make it okay to not always be on. To be able to, do, to take a break in the middle of the day, to go for a walk, to do something with your daughter, to, to do whatever that is. And that needs to be okay. That schedules are going to be a little bit more fluid. Meetings may need to be a little bit more asynchronous. But again, that needs to be okay. But also more than anything, I think we need to make not being okay, okay. Because the thing is, is that if we want to talk about being more human, if we want to talk about being more empathetic, it means that sometimes 
you people just need somebody to listen to. They, they you need to be able to create a space where conversation can happen, and it's not trying to fix them. It's not doing the white knight thing of rushing in and trying to make everything okay. Because that's the thing is if if the reaction feels too big, if it doesn't feel authentic, people are not going to share with you in the future. They're not going to trust you the way that they should in the future. And so that's the thing is it even if it's just saying, look, you know, I'm not at my best today, or even if we use a leader is showing up and just saying, look, I may not be at my best today and we're going to need to move some things around just that level of humanity and that level of honesty, that level of vulnerability, I think goes a really long way because there is just, and especially in these sort of moments and in working remote, there is no substitute for a real connection. You know, if you just want to fake it, if you just want to phone it in, people are going to know they're not going to stick around. They're not going to be able to follow you in that same sort of way. Look, we're all busy. We all have stuff to do. I get it. And for leaders, it's more than most. But yet, but again, there is going to be no substitute for people feeling valued, for people feeling like they're a part of the team and that you actually really care about what's going on with them. But a big part of that, and I think this was something I had to learn the hard way, is it really is about how do you empower vulnerability? Meaning that what I said before, it is so easy to suffer in silence. It's so easy to be able to do these things. So we want to make sure that we are creating the spaces where people can be human and, and honest and, and be able to do these things because it is easy to suffer in silence. So for me as a leader, I think it's always about how do we create just the spaces for conversations and connections. It's not always about giving people the answer or saying this is what it is we need to do. It's about, again, just sort of opening the door to that, creating the space, get, you know, being able to recognize that this is an issue. And again, trust in other people. that They've been through life just as much as you have. They have just as much to be able to contribute. And again, that ability to come into that space and to be able to talk about something. And as we talked about the kind of the leadership mentalities that fail, one of the biggest ones that I don't think ever worked, but I hear so many leaders say it, is this like, my door is always open approach to mentality where it's like, hey, if there's a problem, just come to me. My door is always open. It makes it much easier on you as a leader to work that way. And I know with some organizations, especially when they're incredibly large, doing one-on-ones and skip levels with everybody is incredibly difficult. But in my experience, the thing is, is that even when we were in person, the time when someone would actually come to talk to you was so far beyond when they probably should have. And things had been so much worse and the problem was so much bigger than what it needed to be just because they felt like it needed to be of a certain magnitude to come talk to you. I think that as you get into a remote setting, this approach fails far, far faster and far bigger because it just doesn't work. Because again, people will just simply choose to suffer in silence because they know in many cases you can't see them or that they can't see what's actually going on. And and that distance will win. So again, this sort of thing of empowering vulnerability is also thinking about some of the things you're doing like this. But it really, at the end of the day, this is the inescapable thing. I think this is the hard thing for a lot of people to adjust to is that remote is absolutely about people first, work second. Again, I would argue this is what it always should have been. This is what we should have been doing all along. The things we're talking about should have been the things that we were concentrating on, but we didn't. And that's a real problem. But you can do things like have an anxiety party. An anxiety party is just get everybody together to really just talk about what is stressing them out. What is keeping them up at night? What are they struggling with? What, what do they not understand? What's causing them anxiety? And you're going to see tribes will start to form. People who have similar problems will start to bound, bind together. People who maybe have been through that and can offer advice will come to help them. But it's just that ability to be able to say, look, like let's just have a moment to not talk about work and to recognize that there are problems that are going on here. So let's just be transparent about what those are. And again, for you as a leader, the other thing I think is really important is to get feedback constantly. Because here again, because of that, that ability, to, the ability to, to be so disconnected from people and how easily that can happen, you want to make sure that you're asking for feedback even more often. To say, hey, what is working, what is not? You know, what should I start doing, stop doing, keep doing? Like Those sort of models work really well in these sort of moments. But a lot of it is also to think about, again, how do you create culture? Or again, just keep culture in ways that maybe you didn't before. Some of this is rethinking the tools. So things like, again, I love this, where you know we use Slack for more than just work. There are channels in here that are about you know pets and different things like that, about cars. This was one that somebody posted that I thought was especially hysterical. That was about, you know again, just the simple thing of learning the, the why, how, and what targets and the circles of that. Because again, you gotta start raising your dog the right way, but it's just, it's so simple. But it, again, it creates a sense of community. It gets you to engage with these tools, lets you engage in and work in these spaces and sort of creates more of those hallway conversations, those fun things that used to happen. Now they can happen all the time. There's a great little bot that we use called Donut. And what Donut does is just every two weeks, it goes through and it pairs two people together to just go out and have a virtual coffee. And I think that's great. 
other things that we do are culture cards. I've talked about these a bunch in the past and in the podcast, but these are just really how do you take your values and print them out on just little business cards and send them out to everybody. And whenever you're having a meeting and things go really well, you can hold up one of these cards and be able to say, hey, look, you know, I really love that you're posting, putting customers at the center of the work that we do. Or if it's something where, again, you're struggling and people aren't doing that, it's a good reminder of what the culture is. And it gives people the ability to have conversations about, hey, how do we keep and stay who we are? And it lets in these moments for that sort of stuff to happen. So simple, but so effective. But also take advantage of the tools and take advantage of what's going on. So again, if you're on Zoom, have a silly hat day. Have you know the ability to do a funny shirt day. Bring your pet to work day. Bring your son or daughter to work day. I sort of love the, the guy in the top right corner who is clearly flexing in his background cred with the insane amount of toilet paper and paper towels that they have there. But that's the thing, right, is that encourage people to have fun with it, to be able to bring their personality, to do this sort of stuff. Again, it doesn't have to be so somber and serious and all just work. If you did stuff like this at work and it was fun, do it here. But a lot of this, once again, comes back to trust. And, and again, you may have seen these slides before. And if you do, this will just be a recap because I think it's that important. But the most challenging thing of leading remotely is that you have to trust people and this out of sight team that they're actually working. And that that I think seems to be the biggest challenge for a lot of people in these moments. Because look, and that's what I've said, trust to me is the key to everything. When you look at high performing teams, high performing companies, whenever you do this sort of stuff, trust is the key to everything, whether it's remote or it's in person. And again, there are two different types of trust and it's so important to understand the difference between these, that there is practical and emotional trust. Practical trust is just what it sounds like. It is earned by doing the basics, showing up on time, doing what you'll say, practical things. These tend to express themselves in process, tools, applications, right? Like these are the foundational, simple things. And, that, and the problem though is that if that's all you have are just the basics, you tend to have a lot of people who will generally show up just for a paycheck. Because that's the thing is that for them, they are just gonna be able to do the bare minimum and that's enough. But again, to be able to really lead, to be able to break through, to do the sort of work that I think so many of us want to do, we need to be able to get to emotional trust. And emotional trust is, again, that I believe you're on my side, that I can share something with you that might hurt me, that might embarrass me, that may cause me political problems, like something inside of the company. But again, as you look at the teams that really excel, they all have emotional trust. You hear them use emotional words like I believe in the company's mission or my boss believes in me. There's an emotional basis to what they talk about. But often we see that then through culture, through leadership, and the way that this comes to life is then really transformational. But this is the case where people then will come to work for each other. Again, if we look at other things, if we look at sports teams, if we look at the military, even if you look at musicians, right? Like jazz is a living exhibition in emotional trust of just sort of following along with everybody else. I mean, how superheroes that again, you watch an Avengers movie, they always struggle until they trust each other. And it's that emotional trust is really what it's all about. But that's the thing is that the problem is that most companies and most teams just focus only on practical trust. And whenever that's all it is we have, that's why we struggle. But everybody loves numbers and loves stats. And here are some that, again, if you want to get people or even for you to understand why high trust is important, is that if you look at high trust teams, on average, they have 106% more, more energy. They're about three quarters less stressed. They're about 50% more productive, 76% more engaged, 40, they're 40% 40 less likely to burn out, that in many cases they're about 30% more satisfied with their lives and they take 13% fewer sick days. Because that's the thing is our mentality rules our physical being, it, it rules so much of what it is we do. And again, if I know that I'm showing up for other people, if I have emotional and high trust in that, the benefits 100% show up in the work and they show up in people. So again, these are the sort of numbers that are really hard to ignore. But the exercise I always ask people to do with this is to take an inventory of it, is to realize there are essentially three sorts of trust here. There is none practical and emotional because none is an option. But to do a scorecard, think of the five or 10 coworkers that you work with the most. Write their names down. And then what I want you to do is to do an inventory of what sort of trust you have with them. None, practical, or emotional. And if it is emotional, I'll be honest, I think you sort of get half points if it is emotional because you've done something together outside of work. Your kids play baseball together. You go for a beer once a month. You go out to lunch, right? If you do those sort of things, it's the recognition that you may have an emotional trust in somebody because of something that happened outside of just work. But again, it's that ability to be able to just take an inventory. And I think the results of this are often sobering. But the final thought that I'll sort of leave everybody with around this is that, look, this is a once in a generation opportunity to take a pause, to do something different, to have that reason 
to rethink and to evolve for you as a leader, but also then for the organization that you're a part of. And, you know, what we need to do is that, you know, again, these are all the things that, again, I would argue have been there all along. We just haven't had the urgency or the need or the focus to be able to work on them. And now we do. But here again, this is why, and again, this is a statement I've used for so many talks for so long that keeps staying more relevant, is that comfort is the enemy of greatness. Because at the end of the day, it's that sort of complacency. It's sweeping things under the rug. It's knowing that there are these hard issues we need to deal with, but we don't want to. Those are the things that really then start to become the issue. But these are the moments now when we have this opportunity in working remote, it's again, to be able to work on this stuff. So, hey, hopefully this is helpful. If you need to get in touch with any of this stuff, if you want me to come talk to your team or talk to you or do any of these things, that's my email address. So feel free to reach out to be able to talk about this stuff. Okay, well, that was the talk. And hopefully you were able to be able to get some things out of that. Like I said, it, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody, but these are the sort of things and the things that if you think about them, work on them, give yourself credit that you probably know more than you think you do. But that these are the things that are going to make you a much more effective and much better remote leader. So, hey, once again, if you like the content, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel. And as always, stay crazy.